Max Horkheimer, Theodore W. Adorno, Dialectic of Enlightenment. In the turmoil of the 1940s, two brilliant German thinkers crafted a work of philosophy that would change the way we understand the modern world. In it, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer made a startling claim. The very ideals of reason and progress that were supposed to liberate humanity have instead led us down a dark path. They argued that the Enlightenment, which promised to free us from superstition and ignorance, has itself become a new form of mythology, one that enslaves us to the logic of domination and control. In this blink, you'll discover how these provocative ideas can help us make sense of the crises and contradictions of our own time, from the rise of authoritarianism to the ecological catastrophe that looms on the horizon. Not so enlightened after all. Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer were two of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century. As leading figures of the Frankfurt School, a group of intellectuals associated with the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt, Germany, they sought to understand the ways in which modern society had gone astray. Their most famous collaboration, Dialectic of Enlightenment, was written during the darkest days of World War II, and it reflects the urgency and despair of that historical moment. At the heart of the work is a profound critique of the Enlightenment, the intellectual and cultural movement that emerged in 18th century Europe. The Enlightenment championed reason, science, and individual liberty as the keys to human progress and emancipation. It rejected traditional forms of authority, like religion and monarchy, and instead placed its faith in the power of human rationality to solve the world's problems. But as Adorno and Horkheimer saw it, the Enlightenment had failed to deliver on its promises. Instead of creating a world of freedom and equality, it gave rise to new forms of domination and oppression. The very tools of reason and science that were supposed to liberate humanity had instead been used to control and manipulate people, reducing them to mere objects of study and exploitation. One key theme is the idea that myth and enlightenment are not opposites, but rather two sides of the same coin. In other words, the Enlightenment's quest to demystify the world and eliminate superstition became itself a kind of myth, a belief system that is just as irrational and oppressive as the old forms of religion and magic. This idea is perhaps best illustrated in the culture industry. Adorno and Horkheimer suggest that popular culture, from movies and music to advertising and magazines, is not simply a form of entertainment, but rather a powerful tool of social control. By creating a world of false needs and desires, the culture industry keeps people docile and complacent, unable to imagine any alternative to the status quo. But the insights of their work go far beyond the realm of popular culture. Adorno and Horkheimer argue that the Enlightenment's emphasis on instrumental reason, the idea that everything in the world can be reduced to a means to an end, has led to a kind of moral and spiritual impoverishment, a loss of meaning and purpose in life. Ultimately, dialectic of enlightenment is not just a work of abstract philosophy or cultural criticism. It is a deeply personal and passionate response to the horrors of the 20th century and a call to arms for anyone who still believes in the possibility of a better world. To understand why, let's take a closer look. Enlightenment Promises The Enlightenment was a period of intellectual and cultural change that swept across Europe in the 18th century. It was a time of great optimism and hope, as thinkers and writers championed the power of reason to transform society and improve the human condition. The Enlightenment thinkers, like Descartes, Voltaire and Kant, believed that by applying the methods of science and rational inquiry to all areas of life, they could create a world of progress, prosperity, and individual freedom. At the heart of the Enlightenment project was the idea of individualism. The Enlightenment thinkers rejected the traditional notion that people were defined by their place in a hierarchical social order, and instead 
argued that each person had the right to think and act for themselves. They championed the values of liberty, equality and fraternity and fought against the arbitrary power of kings and priests. Another key idea of the Enlightenment was the notion of progress. Many Enlightenment thinkers believed that human society was constantly evolving and improving and that through the application of reason and science, society could create a better future for all. They looked to the example of the scientific revolution, which had transformed human understanding of the natural world, and believed that the same methods could be applied to the study of human society and behaviour. However, Adorno and Horkheimer argue that the Enlightenment project was not without its contradictions and limitations. One of the key problems they identify is the way in which the Enlightenment's emphasis on reason and individualism could lead to a kind of instrumentalization of the world. By reducing everything to a means to an end, the Enlightenment thinkers risked losing sight of the intrinsic value of things in themselves. This problem is particularly acute when it comes to the Enlightenment's treatment of nature. Adorno and Horkheimer argue that the Enlightenment thinkers saw nature as something to be conquered and controlled rather than as a source of beauty and wonder in its own right. They point to the way in which the Industrial Revolution, which was in many ways a product of Enlightenment thinking, led to the exploitation and degradation of the natural world. Another issue that Adorno and Horkheimer highlight is the way in which the Enlightenment's emphasis on individualism could lead to a kind of atomization of society. By prioritizing the rights and freedoms of the individual over the needs of the community, the Enlightenment thinkers risked creating a world in which people were isolated and disconnected from one another. Despite these criticisms, however, Adorno and Horkheimer do not reject the Enlightenment project altogether. Rather, they argue that we need to rethink and reformulate the Enlightenment's core values in light of the challenges and crises of the modern world. They suggest that rather than simply celebrating reason and individualism, we need to recognise the ways in which these values can be co-opted and distorted by the forces of domination and oppression. The Dark Side of Reason The previous chapter explored some of the key ideas and thinkers of the Enlightenment and hinted at the ways in which Adorno and Horkheimer saw this intellectual movement as inherently flawed. Now, let's dive deeper into their core concept of the dialectical reversal of enlightenment. At its core, the dialectical reversal refers to the way that the very tools and ideas that were supposed to liberate humanity from superstition and oppression have instead been turned against us, leading to new and even more insidious forms of domination and control. They argue that this is not simply an accident or a betrayal of enlightenment ideals, but rather an inherent tendency within the logic of Enlightenment rationality itself. One of the key examples that Adorno and Horkheimer point to is the rise of modern totalitarianism in the 20th century. They suggest that the horrors of Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia were not aberrations or deviations from the Enlightenment project, but rather its logical conclusion. By reducing human beings to mere objects of manipulation and control, and by elevating the state and its leaders to the status of all-powerful gods, these regimes represented the ultimate triumph of instrumental reason over human freedom and dignity. The authors see it at work in many other areas of modern life too. They point to the capitalist economy reducing everything to a commodity to be bought and sold, even human labour and creativity. They argue that the mass media and culture industry create a world of false needs and desires, keeping people trapped in a cycle of consumption and conformity, and suggest that even the most intimate aspects of our lives, from our relationships to our sense of self, are shaped by the logic of domination and control. One of the most striking examples in recent years has been the rise of digital technology and social media. On the surface, these tools seem to offer unprecedented opportunities for connection, creativity and self-expression. But as many critics note, they have also given rise to new forms of surveillance, manipulation and addiction. 
Adorno and Horkheimer would likely see these developments as further evidence of the dialectical reversal at work. They would argue that the very tools and ideas that were supposed to protect us from tyranny and oppression, things like free speech, democratic elections, and the rule of law, have instead been weaponized against us, used to create a world that is even more unjust and unfree than the one that came before. But as we'll discover, Adorno and Horkheimer's critique is not a counsel of despair. Instead, it is a call to arms, an invitation to think critically about the world we live in and to imagine new forms of resistance and emancipation. Capitalism, Virtue and the Introversion of Sacrifice In the previous chapter, we explored how the very tools and ideas meant to liberate humanity have often been turned against us. This isn't just an external phenomenon, though. It's an internal process as well. This is what Adorno and Horkheimer describe as the introversion of our sacrifice in capitalism. To understand this concept, we must first look at the role of sacrifice in pre-modern societies. In many cultures, sacrifice is a way of maintaining social cohesion and appeasing the gods. By offering up a portion of the harvest or a prized animal, people sought to ensure continued favour and the well-being of the community. But as Adorno and Horkheimer note, the nature of sacrifice has changed in the modern world. With the rise of capitalism and the Enlightenment emphasis on individualism, sacrifice has become internalised and individualised. Instead of communal, sacrifice is now something that each person performs on their own, often without even realising it. One of the ways the introversion of sacrifice manifests itself is through the culture of consumerism. In a capitalist society, we are constantly being told that we need to buy more, work harder, and chase after the latest fashions and gadgets. But in doing so, we end up sacrificing our own freedom and autonomy, giving up our time and energy in pursuit of false needs and desires. The introversion of sacrifice also works to maintain social hierarchies and power structures. Those at the top of the economic ladder enjoy the fruits of others' sacrifices, while those at the bottom bear the costs. This can take many forms, from the exploitation of low-wage workers to the destruction of the environment in the name of profit. Adorno and Horkheimer see this dynamic playing out in many areas of modern life. The education system often forces students to sacrifice their own interests to conform to the demands of the job market. The healthcare system prioritises the needs of insurance companies and pharmaceutical corporations over patients' well-being. Perhaps the most insidious aspect of the introversion of sacrifice is the way that it is often presented as a virtue, a sign of moral superiority and self-discipline. We are told that by working hard, delaying gratification and making sacrifices, we can achieve success and happiness. But Adorno and Horkheimer point out that this is ultimately a trap, a way of keeping us locked into a system that benefits only a select few. The introversion of sacrifice is not just a personal problem, but a social and political one too. It is a key part of the machinery of late capitalism, a way of keeping people docile and compliant in the face of growing inequality and injustice. And, as we'll see in the final section, it is something that we must confront and challenge if we hope to create a more just and humane world. Nothing is objective. So Enlightenment thinking promised to liberate humanity from myth and superstition, and in many ways ended up creating new forms of domination and control. But perhaps the most startling insight of Adorno and Horkheimer's work is the idea that reason and science, the very tools that were supposed to free humanity from irrationality and ignorance, have themselves become a kind of myth or superstition. In reality, science and reason are neither neutral or objective. They are shaped by the same social and political forces as everything else in our society. And when humans treat them as infallible or all-powerful, we risk falling into the same kind of mythological thinking 
that the Enlightenment was supposed to overcome. Consider how so many blindly trust in the pronouncements of experts and authorities, whether they be doctors, politicians, or tech gurus, or the way some cultures fetishize innovation and progress as if new technologies and products will somehow magically solve all problems, or the way that some use science and reason as a cudgel to shut down dissent or unique perspectives. But what can humans do to confront these tendencies in ourselves and in society? Adorno and Horkheimer would likely argue that the first step is to cultivate a critical and reflexive attitude toward the world. Be willing to question the assumptions and beliefs that you take for granted, and look beneath the surface of things, and ask who benefits and who suffers from the way that societies are organised. They would urge attunement to the ways in which science and reason can be used to justify and perpetuate systems of oppression and exploitation. That we should be willing to listen to the voices of those who have been marginalised or excluded and take their experiences and perspectives seriously. And finally, that we need to recognise the problems we face are not just technical or scientific, but deeply political and moral as well. We cannot simply rely on experts or authorities to solve these problems. Instead, we must engage in the difficult work of building a more just and humane world through collective action and individual solidarity. Ultimately, this philosophy is not a roadmap or a blueprint for this kind of emancipatory politics, but a powerful reminder of the ways in which even our most cherished ideas and values can be turned against us and a call to remain vigilant and critical in the face of every challenge and crisis that we face.